Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for inviting me to be with you here today. And I want to start by thanking Andrew for allowing me to speak here this afternoon. Uh, I was initially planned to, to be here tomorrow, but uh, tomorrow morning, together with the other, other Nordic uh, heads of state, uh, I will be at Ground Zero, where the five of us will pay the respect uh, of our nations to those uh, who died uh, and suffered, uh, to their families uh, uh, and their friends. So thank you again for allowing me to speak here today and change your program a little bit. But above all, thank you for allowing me to witness this remarkable dialogue that I enjoyed thoroughly uh, here this morning. Well, 9-11, as all of you know, and we all know, uh, symbolized a way in which nations occasionally come to historic crossroads. And the effects and the implications uh, are going to be with us for a long time. But three years ago, my nation, in a very different way, because nobody was hurt, nobody got killed, also came to historic uh, crossroads. So let me here today try to convey to you some of the lessons that we have learned during uh, those three years. And I will also try to link it to the clean energy uh, debate that we saw here uh, in the beginning. But if you were giving the laboratory task <clears throat> of testing the resilience of a nation, I can't really imagine a tougher way to do it than to start with a complete collapse of the entire banking system and the economic crisis that followed. And then about a year later, throw in one of the uh, most dramatic volcanic eruptions we have seen for centuries, covering farmlands and regions in thick layers of us, and as many of you know, stopping air traffic all over Europe for almost a week. And then if that was not enough, then about half a year later or so, throw in another eruption, just to test us even further, and remind all of us that despite the technological excellence that we are seeing here today, we are not yet the masters of the universe. It has indeed been a sobering experience, both the economic crisis and the display of the, of the forces of nature. But now of, we are three years later, Fortunately, in a position that our re economic recovery is on its way. We have come back from the crisis earlier and more effectively than anybody could have predicted. Economic growth has now started. Unemployment is lower than in many countries uh, in Europe. And uh, this year and last year were the best tourism year ever uh, for Iceland. So many people looking at the crisis that are still characterizing the situation in the US and in Europe are asking themselves the question, how did Iceland do it? Uh, what are the lessons that we can all learn from uh, the Icelandic experience? As I will try in the 16 minutes that are left for me to convey uh, some of these uh, uh, to you. When my country, became the first to be hit by the financial tsunami in uh, October of uh, 2008. The collapse of the banks within a few weeks came to threaten, and this is a very fundamental point, came to threaten not just our economy, but our entire democratic and social system. There were protests, there were riots, the police had to defend the parliament and the prime minister's office, and the inherent balance of the Icelandic society was in grave danger. Iceland, as you might know, has been for centuries one of the most peaceful and secure and harmonious, democratic, open and free countries in the world. And if a failure and a collapse of a financial system can disrupt our democratic 
community and our entire political and social system in the way it did, just imagine what a financial collapse and a deep economic crisis can do to countries where democracy is not as solidly and historically strong and doesn't have the same fundamental basis as we have enjoyed in Iceland. So that is perhaps one of the first very important lessons, that the marketing system, whether people like it or not, carries a profound political and social responsibility. There is an inherent link between the implications of what happened in the economic area and the democratic and the social fate of our nations. We were fortunate in Iceland to realize in the very beginning that in order to deal successfully with this economic crisis, we had to instigate not only economic and financial measures, but also comprehensive political and judicial reforms. Uh, the government resigned. We called parliamentary elections to give the people the right to choose a new assembly. We appointed uh, an office of special prosecutor to look comprehensively into whoever had possibly broken uh, the law. We changed the leadership of the central bank and the financial regul regulatory authority. We appointed a special commission headed by a Supreme Court judge to examine the failure of every institution in our society. Not just the banks and the corporations, but also the media, the universities, uh, the ministries, and even the presidency. I don't know of any other nation, definitely not in Europe, that has responded to an economic and financial crisis of this nature with such comprehensive political, judicial, and social reforms. And the implication of that is that if you want to deal successfully with the economic crisis now facing many countries in the world, is that without you, do, without you doing it in this comprehensive way, we doubt in Iceland very sincerely whether you will be able to, uh, to gather success. Of course, we instigated many economic measures, and they are, of course, important. We, uh, due to our own currency, the krona, were able to through the devaluation to strengthen our export sector. This is an option not open to the Euro, Euro countries. But also, and perhaps above all, we did not pump public money into these private banks. We said squarely, these are private financial institutions, and their failure should not become the economic responsibility of, uh, of ordinary people. And throughout this process, both these de decisions we had to make in, in the economic area, as well as this comprehensive approach of, uh, of e not just economic, but also legislative, executive, and judicial reforms, it was brought home to us, which I believe many of my fellow leaders in other countries have not yet faced very squarely, that this crisis has brought forward the crucial linkage between the economy and the state, but also, above all, between democracy on one hand and the free market on the other, which should be paramount in the resurrection of our societies, economics, or politics? It's a question we have not discussed in the Western world for many decades. But this is really the fundamental question which the financial crisis has brought uh, to our table. It can, in my opinion, no longer be evaded, simply because there is too much at stake, as we saw in Iceland, in a nutshell, and as you can now almost every day witness in the United States and in many parts of Europe. And twice, twice events brought this dilemma squarely to my table. First in 2010 and then earlier this year, when the so-called I-SAVE issue, which some of you might have heard of, which 
in its essence, was the question which Britain and the Netherlands demanded that the people of Iceland, ordinary farmers and fishermen and doctors and teachers and nurses should be made responsible for the financial losses of the Icelandic private banks that had operated in Britain uh, and the Netherlands. So through the support of all the European Union countries, the government of Britain and the Netherlands tried to pressure us in Iceland into taking responsibility as a nation, as a people, for the financial losses of these banks. And our parliament had passed the so-called iSafe law, and I was faced with the question whether I should sign it or whether I should put to the people uh, in, a, in a referendum. And when all the complicated analysis had been swept away, my choice was, in fact, crystal clear. The will of the people, on one hand, versus the force of the market uh, on the other. And every government in Europe was telling me, and many strong interests in my own country, that if I did not choose with the financial market, it would lead to a financial disaster uh, for, for the country. But I chose the democratic will of the people. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, what has happened since has not brought out all the negative dark predictions that the so-called pundits and experts and media, uh, what shall I call them, media leaders all over the world were in fact were in fact predicting. And I believe the United States and Europe is still facing this choice. Not just because what we could call the economic, the tonic plates are shifting uh, in a way we have not seen for a long time, but also because information technology and social media has, as all of you know, now empowered people in such a way that they are in fact able to challenge the traditional political institutions as never before. It is often quoted that we have seen this in Cairo, we are seeing it in Athens, we saw it uh, a few days ago in 1,000 cities in the United States and in other parts of Europe. But we saw it also in Iceland in the last three years in a very clear and concise form. When the banks collapsed in 2008, we faced every Saturday street protest in the center of Reykjavik, turning the parliament square almost into a, a street assembly. And these people were called together by the courtesy of the internet. Then, in the following months and into 2009, when the riots were threatening our institutions, as I mentioned before, the uh, mobile texting was their tool of, of bringing them together. And then, last winter, when the so-called barrel protests outside our all official buildings were reminding the authorities that they had not taken enough care of the ordinary concerns of the unemployed and the people and the poor, the Facebook became their tool of mobilization. The lesson is that demonstrations and protests, which in my early years, when I engaged in those protests as a student, took weeks and even months to prepare, and had to involve a wide network of institutions have now become an instant phenomenon. So the information technology and the social media has now fundamentally, in my opinion, transformed the democratic system of our country. So what we are now seeing is people power in its purest form. And it's enhanced by the social media, but the fundamental essence is to challenge governmental and parliamentary institutions as never before. And I have even concluded, and it's a kind of a strange conclusion from somebody who has lived most of his active life within the more established institutions of the ministries, the parliament, and now the presidency, that the uh, pace of change and the power of this social media has now become so strong, so central to the change in our societies, with such speed and uh, implications, 
that the traditional decision-making processes within the institutions have almost become a sideshow. And I know that is a very strong statement, but I, I believe unless we realize that fundamental lesson, we are going to be in a both decision-making wilderness as well as an economic and democratic wilderness. But there are many other lessons that can be learned from the Icelandic experience. And since my time is running out, I'm going to run through them very quickly. As an homage to Supermanian, I will say one of the lessons also is the significance of China. When the European Union countries were pressurizing us to take responsibility for the failed banks, and the United States authorities, including Timothy Geithner, had simply lost interest in Iceland. <laughs> the president of China and the prime minister were the people we were able to have a dialogue with. And it's one of the indications of that the arrival of China, as was said here this morning, is here and now, not 10 or 20 years from now, that the leadership of China is the, was that leadership which we were able to have a most constructive dialogue with following the collapse of the banking system leading to a currency swap agreement between the Central Bank of Iceland and the Central Bank of China. I could also tell you that throughout my presidency, I have received more delegations in Iceland from China than from the US, Britain, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain combined. The second lesson is that the banks have in fact become high-tech companies, threatening the growth of the creative sectors of our economies, even if the banks are extraordinarily successful. Because what we discovered in Iceland when the banks collapsed was that the pool of talent that the banks had taken into the ranks, engineers, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, programmers, even artists, musicians, designers, and others, suddenly became available on the market. And a lot of creative companies in many different sectors in my country then hired them. And paradoxically, the last two years after the banking collapse have been the most successful years for these creative companies in my country. And I could give you many examples. But the lesson is that the big banking sector, a big financial sector, even if, and perhaps especially if it is extraordinarily successful, is very bad news for a country that wants to, it's very bad news for a country that wants to be a player in the creative 21st century uh, economy. The third lesson is the importance of clean energy. When I was young, over 80% of our energy was from imported oil and coal. But in the last few decades, we have moved over to being 100% clean energy in terms of all electricity production and uh, space heating. And this clean energy dominance of Iceland has now made the country a very attractive location for investment, not just by aluminum companies like uh, Alcoa, Rio Tinto, and Century Aluminum, but now with, with data storage centers which are being built in my country for a number of reasons. One is the combination of clean energy and data storage. The other is the running cost of the data centers in Iceland is about 40% less than in other countries because we don't need comprehensive and complicated air conditioning to cool them down. We simply open the window. <laughs> and, and, also, and also you have a lot of space. And Iceland is still one of the most secure countries uh, in the world. So paradoxically, following the financial crisis, due to the clean energy, we have had a running stream of companies wanting to invest in Iceland. So the lesson is that if you have built up a clean energy economy, it will help you to get out of a financial crisis in the future. A clean energy economy is a good insurance policy, perhaps the best one you can buy in order to guard yourself against financial crisis in the future. Also because it provides the people with a lot of energy at a low cost. But then let me conclude 
by mentioning briefly the eruptions. The Eyjafjallajökull jökull eruption, which we found very easy, find very easy to pronounce. <laughs> it was, uh, as all of you know, dramatic. There were 500 tons of material that came out of that volcano every second for three days. For three days. But due to the early warning system, and the comprehensive rescue system we have built on by using mobile uh, internet and information technology, reaching into every household, every farm, we were able to bring everybody out, make everybody safe, and ensure that those local communities could recover within a few months. It is a dramatic confirmation that in the world of natural hazards, the tools available to us now can help us to prevent these natural hazards having negative impacts on our communities and our societies. So here we are in Iceland, three years later, with a vibrant economy, economic growth on its way, with a society which has learned important lessons, being able to deal with fundamental natural disasters, bringing the positive message to the rest of the world that if we react in the right way to this crisis, if we respect the will of the people, as well as using the opportunities that these new tools offer us, we can indeed go forward and strengthen our societies, both as democracies, as communities, and as areas of economic prosperity. That's the positive message I want to bring you here today. And three years ago, nobody in my country, including myself, could have believed that three years later, I could come here to Camden and give you such a positive message. <laughs> <laughs>